Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We are joined by Jason Hanks, of, well, currently of Filevine. Now, Jason has over five years' experience in the sales ops game and a little bit more before that, uh, unofficially in sales ops, I believe. So, Jason, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, so let's kick off by understanding how you first managed to get into sales ops and what were the roles you were doing before? Sure. Yeah. So I, I kind of fell into it, to be honest with you. I uh, got my degree in accounting, not that I ever wanted to be an accountant, but um, so it was a good skill to kind of learn. And that's where I started my business career. I, I joined a, a startup company right, uh, right out of college and was running their day-to-day -day accounting um, at that at that company, we had Salesforce, but we weren't using it near to its capabilities. We had very simple um, what we were kind of doing with it. And our COO at the time wanted to really make a, a big investment in it and build it out and really get a lot from it. And so being the numbers guy, he asked for some of my help in building some of the dashboards and the reports. And obviously to do those, you have to know the background of how that data is collected and put together and, and the processes that go into that. So I ended up teaching myself Salesforce at that time and, and realized that I, I really enjoyed that aspect of the, the company of building out processes, building out Salesforce, looking at the data on that side. And um, and so I was kind of unofficially running our sales ops team. We were a small company, like I said, and I was still running the finance and accounting. We were acquired um, a couple years later and, and by a much bigger company out of San Francisco. Um, after the initial integration of all the finance and stuff, it kind of came down to, hey, you don't wear 10 different hats. You specialize in something when you work for a bigger company. So I had a couple options ahead of me if I wanted to pursue more down the accounting finance or explore the sales ops world that I had never even heard there was a title for until that moment. And, uh, um, you know, my personality just fits a little bit better with it. So I decided to to take the plunge and become an official sales ops, um, you know, employee and never look back since I've, I've jumped around a few different startups, worked in different industries from FinTech to outsourcing HR to, you know, startups and mature companies. And, um, so had several different experiences with it, but, um, yeah, that's like I said, I just kind of fell into it and just natural fit. Got it. So you chose, you chose the light side. Yes, exactly. exactly. Stayed away, stayed away from the dark side, chose the light. And so you, you said there was part of your personality that you felt suited sales ops more. What part of your personality was that, would you say? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, the accounting side is I, I really like to problem solve. I really like to solve problems build processes and things. I've kind of got that nerdy operations background, but I'm also a pretty competitive person and I like being involved in what I call kind of the offensive side of the, the company. I felt like um, accounting and finance, I was very much a reaction to other things happening in the company where the sales ops, I felt, um, I feel like I'm a part of building out the plan, the attack plan, where we're going, what we're going to bring in. And, and, you know, like I said, being a part of the offense. And so that competitive side of me, you know, I like trying to win and, and build that out kind of plays with, with the nerdy operations and building out the processes and things. So it kind of all fit my analytical brain, my process brain and my, you know, um, my competitive wanting to win brain all, all kind of came together. Got it. Awesome. Um, so zooming in today on Filevine, how many, how, many, how many people in the ops team and how many sales reps are we supporting? Yeah, so we have, we have currently three of us, including myself. Um, and then we also have a marketing ops person who he rolls up directly to marketing, but we work hand in hand with that person. We have, um, we have about 12 AEs and then another um, 10 to 12 SDRs as well that we're supporting. Um, we are we are currently working with our implementation and customer success, although our primary focus is mostly on the sales team. So that kind of small team that I um, that I kind of ex described there. Got it. And does the success team have any ops resources? No, not not specific besides us. So that is something that's a big initiative for us in, in 2020 is to 
um, become a lot more involved and bring sales and customer success a lot, uh, bring them together a lot more. So I think we'll, we'll see that expand, but currently uh, there's no specific resources for them besides us. Got it. So your, your sales team are also going to be involved in the support side, so the renewals and the upsells. Uh-huh, exactly. Interesting. And so would you then start, like, you think you'll change the name of the sales ops team? Like you'll call it RevOps or do you think like how yeah. is your position on that? Yeah, definitely. I think we're, we're, we're headed down that path here soon. Whether, I mean, I think revenue ops is kind of the new trigger word that, that everybody's hearing. I think that's definitely an option or, or business uh, systems administration, kind of depending on what we want to do. But um, yes, we, I think we definitely kind of changed the name into something a little bit broader to show that we kind of support the entire company. Got it. And current uh, sales tech stack, please. Yeah, so um, we do use HubSpot for, do, for the marketing automation. I mentioned we have that marketing ops person. That's their primary role is kind of running that. We are on Salesforce. That's our, pri- our CRM. We're big Salesforce users here. But we also use our own software quite a bit. Um, we, it's called a case management software, but it's pretty robust and customizable. So we, we're actually transitioning a lot of our day-to-day actions and how we work as a company through there, um, which is a big, a big initiative and having that work with Salesforce. Um, we use outreach to engage with our customers, emails, calls, all of that, love outreach. We, we recently just purchased a, a software called Exec Vision, which is a conversation intelligence platform. That's been an amazing training tool for us. It records the calls, it analyzes them, breaks it down, you know, scores, all of that stuff. We've loved that. We use Cloudingo to uh, that that helps eliminate dupes and and um, you know whether we're inputting lists or it syncs with Salesforce and takes that out. And then we have Zapier, which we use a lot to do a lot of integrations with with all of these softwares to make sure they're connecting. And Domo, we use Domo as a, our BI tool. Got it. Nice. Very comprehensive. Um, can you share something you've done at some point at Filevine that has boosted productivity of the reps? Yeah, absolutely. So my, my kind of go-to is um, pipeline. I, I, you know, I, I think there's a ton that can happen with minor changes to managing pipeline correctly. So that's usually what I like to look at and monitor first when I when I kind of come into a new place or just to refresh and so coming into Filevine we have an incredible VP of sales who's very on top of his team's um, pipeline but but primarily the ones that are closer to closing versus just looking at the the entire pipeline in general so uh, that was one of the first things that I I looked at was um was how big our pipeline was, how many ops were in it, uh, what were we actively working, and then the ones that we weren't that had been, you know, stale for quite a while. And I, I obviously looked at our average close times and, and found that the ones that were 100 days past that, we weren't actively working. Let's recycle those. Let's kick those out. Let the SDR team try to drum those up again. Um, and we actually found, so obviously kind of had that doomsday of mass closed lost opportunities and cleaned everybody's pipelines up. Um, we didn't lose any productivity from our sales reps. They were able to still, still keep their pipelines going and close some great deals. And then we were actually, the SDR team was able to revive several of those deals. And we closed within a month, two or three of those deals that had been stalled for three or four months. So um, keeping that up, up to date has been a really big one. The other side, looking at the pipeline is looking at close rates and then breaking that down by the size of deals. I found that we actually do really well with bigger deals, mid, mid-market and enterprise deals. We have great close rates, but the majority of our resources from an SDR standpoint were um, towards SMB just because those you can get a lot more a lot faster so I actually completely redid our our sales development team I, I run our SDR team as well here to shift more resources to mid-market and enterprise and we set less but the average deal size is actually um, three times bigger now than it was when we were we were setting for SMB so and we're not we're not a third less so the num the numbers work out to where we're adding so much more into the into the pipeline of revenue each each month even if it's a couple less deals so those are a couple of things that i've done just in the last couple of months 
Got it. So I quickly want to summarize. On the first one, you you basically did a big culling, or you looked at all of the deals that had a that were had been alive for a hundred days, and then you. Is, is that right? Are they you? Yeah, I would just say that we're over kind of our natural, our, our average close rate as far as days. They were just over that. I used 100 as an example, but, um, you know, anything over our, our how, how long it took us to close one of those deals, generally on an average, um, the reps had to explain why they were still wanting to work it. Otherwise, we were close losing it, sending it back through the pipeline. Got it. And then the second one, this is super interesting, right? So you did the the close rate analysis, found that mid to enterprise, you had significantly higher close rate, um, but the SMBs were putting more, oh no, the FDRs were putting more SMB deals into the pipeline. Was that because their con- commission was incentivizing them to do that? Yeah, so we are we are commissioned off of we we call home um, SAL sales accepted leads. So we set an appointment up for our for our AEs. They do a discovery call and then they decide if they want to accept it or not. We obviously have you know guidelines that really keep that process clean. It's not just you know do I want this or not, but they they do ultimately have the choice if they want to accept it or not. So it's not based off of the average revenue. It's based off of how many accepted. Now, we do split our SDRs into segments. We have SMB, we have mid-market, we have enterprise. So they can only set for certain ones, but we we found that we were getting so many of those SMBs that we had more resources there, not realizing that it was actually hurting us. Got it. So then you shifted the weighting between SMB to mid-market to enterprise. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then that, and then you ended up having three times the size of pipeline. No, three times as many, three times less deals. No, less than three times less deals, <laughs> but three times the pipeline. Right. Right. The the, the less deals was only was honestly only about ten to fifteen percent less um, appointments that we were setting, but the average deal that we were putting into the pipeline was now about three times greater than what what the average was prior to that got it i bet the vp of sales was happy with this wasn't he yeah yeah it was a it's been a good move so far obviously we're still still building it out but it's it's benefited us so far got it awesome um moving on have you had a time where you've had to try and uh convince aes or fdrs to do something new that maybe wasn't like directly tied to them making more commission that you had to try and like get their buy-in for Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I try obviously to tie everything back to how this is going to benefit them. Uh, In a way, I think, you know, this, this exec vision, for example, just putting that out there, um, you know, they see when, when we're kind of launching a new tool and we came with new training processes of, hey, you're going to have several calls graded each, each week and you're going to grade other people's calls and they kind of see a, a little bit more of a time commitment. But helping them understand that this is ultimately going to improve their skills, we're going to track this, um, and, you know, to ultimately get them to a bigger goal was, was kind of the key there. So sometimes it might take a couple more steps in the short term, but the overall picture will benefit them. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's a tr- it's a tricky balance, but definitely have to do it. Got it for painting the long term picture. Now, did I just hear uh, peer to peer grading? Yes, that's yes, interesting, peer- right? Uh huh. Yeah, so exactly. Me as a salesperson, I'm going to have one of my A's grade my calls, and then I'm also going to be grading one of my peers' calls. Correct. Yeah, we, we actually only have it launched for our SDRs right now. The plan is to expand it into the AEs, but we basically, we ask them each week, they have to submit three calls, a good, a bad, and we, we call, you know, an appointment. It, they can choose those three calls. They have to submit it to myself, our SDR manager, and then somebody else on their team. And they, and it can be anybody else that they, they want. Uh, we prefer one of the team leads or something like that. And then they're going to have some submitted to them each week. So, we're all kind of grading each other and that way you can compare how different people grade and what we're all kind of looking at and we all improve together as a team got it so i at the end of every week i'm sending one call each to you that my manager and a peer so yes yeah ex- exactly um and sometimes both because you can share one call with several people so we recommend doing everyone to them all but we say one has to go to each person so the peer doesn't necessarily have to be on all three 
but uh, like I, I get all three for them so I can listen to them, but the peers might be on only one or two, a good or a bad or something like that, just to get different feedback. Got it. So then all these people are listening to the calls and then do you log the feedback in, in, a, in one of the tools or is yeah. it done like in Sheets? Yeah, exec vision does it all. It exactly. tracks it all for us. And then it, then it has uh, some great dashboards and reports that kind of track how you're improving. You can tie specific questions to skills. So it can tell you, you know, if you rated low on this question, this is the skill you need to practice and so forth. So, so it's been a fantastic tool. We've, we've only had it for about two months, but really seen some awesome benefits from it. Sounds amazing. Yeah, I should, yeah. Uh, maybe I'll look into that. Yeah, it's a good one. Shout out to exact vision. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Let's um, now focus on forecasting. Now, are you running that process? Yeah, yeah, I am. So we, uh, you know, we, there's obviously, we look at it from an annual basis, a quarterly basis, a monthly basis, and that kind of determines how we are. I think generally when I'm looking longer term, if I'm planning out or forecasting the quarter or the month, um, a, I want to find out what the number is that we're trying to get to. So I, I go with a top down and a, a bottom up kind of approach on both. What's the goal that management wants? And then I work backwards. How many deals does that mean that we have to close at what average size? That means we have to do this many demos. That means we have to have this many SALs, this many demos set. This is, and then I, I work, this is my team. This is what we're doing can we get the two to correlate together? So I get that comprehensive plan to make sure we have the resource to ask, resources to actually hit it. And then tracking actuals versus forecasted and budgeted, what, what we think we can do is I go back to my analyzing the pipeline. Do we making sure we have enough opportunities in the pipeline that fit the deal size? Are we tracking the original assumptions that we made from the beginning? Um, and if not, we need to correct. So I think that's going back. That was kind of one of the factors that led to me wanting to change the team up a little bit is I wasn't necessarily going to get a lot more resources, but I had some higher goals. We had higher revenue goals that we wanted to hit. And so figuring out how we could tweak some of the resources and just change those around um, is how we were able to kind of still produce higher revenues without without getting a lot more resources. So we look at, and then, you know, we look at those pipelines on a weekly basis and our VP of sales is, he, he's more going through each one of them with his team and, and he's very hands-on with the strategic of, you know, what to close and forecasting those out. So he does the more one-offs and I do kind of the higher picture of, do we have enough in the pipeline? What do we need? What do we need to make sure it's full to even give ourselves a chance to close it or to get there? Got it. And then if I said to you that you could only measure one sales metric for the rest of your life, which would you choose? <laughs> that's, that's, that's a really tough one. Um, for, for me, I would probably go back to the, the, uh, the amount of opportunities in your pipeline. I, I, I mean, that's kind of vague and there's so many factors that go into it, but I, I think, um, managing pipeline is is a key thing and understanding the numbers is is really important to it so kind of the uh, the number of opportunities coming in and out each month i think is is really important to manage got it so number for each rep or total for the whole business or both both yeah, yeah. I, I think all these numbers that we kind of look at it's great to look at it holistically as a company and then break it down by reps and even break it down by market segments and so forth um, dissected in all these different ways to find the real story. Got it. Just like you did with the close rate, break that down by market segment to see if there's some insights to be had. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Then final question, who has influenced you the most in sales operations? Yeah. Good, good question. Um, you know, honestly, I, you know, I love Mark Cuban and he gave advice to young people back in, you know, to young people looking for their first job, but I kind of apply it to, to all my jobs as he said, you know, look for a job where you get paid to learn. And so I've kind of approached that with, with all of my jobs, obviously I'm paid to, to produce results too, but um, so I've had some incredible leaders. I, I go back to that, that, that first boss that I had that really pushed us into Salesforce. Um, his name is Nick Sorensen. He's actually the president of a, of a company called Wistic now. 
um, he was very instrumental in getting my career going and it taught me a ton of, of how to understand the processes and, and execute on those, how to work with other teams. And then I'll, I'll be honest, one of the areas I struggled with early on in sales ops, I picked up the technical side, the numbers, the analytical side with my accounting background that came kind of naturally, but understanding a salesman's perspective and the sales um, technique and how my actions impacted them was was pretty difficult for me at first. And so I've had some incredible VP of sales and sales leaders that have really taught me a ton. I'm just going to throw a couple names out here. I, I don't mean to give too many shout outs here, but I mean, Sean Sorensen, uh, Graham Anderson, John call or John Allen, Aaron call. The, these guys have taught me a ton about sales. Um, not that I'm an expert in sales by any means, but really, really brought me along there to where, um, I feel like I can actually contribute a lot more in understanding their perspective and how my actions impact the sales team. So a lot of people I would say have, have influenced me there. A lot of shout outs. Got it. I think I've got five. So Mark Cuban. <laughs> and got Nick, Sean, oh yeah. Yeah. Mark Cuban. <laughs> Nick, Sean, John and, and Aaron. Yeah. And Graham. Get them all. Don't, don't want to forget Graham. Graham. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, we don't. <laughs> um, awesome. Jason, thank you so much. I have two pages of the notes here, but the, um, okay. the, the two things that I really liked, um, your insight breaking down the market segment and then refocusing resources on the higher level deals is great. And I think every sales ops person needs to probably do that right now. Um, <laughs> and then the second one was, oh, where, where is it? Um, oh yeah, the peer grading, peer-to-peer -peer grading. I've never heard of that. Maybe people were yeah. doing it, but I just didn't get it out of them in the interview. But that is yeah. super interesting. Um, yeah. And I bet the, like, the social pressure and the feedback that the SDRs are going to be getting from their peers is going to be, it's going to be super interesting to see what results come out of that. So yeah. Jason, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. I love listening to your, to your guests. So I'm glad that I could contribute. Thank you.